<laughs> okay, how many people finished problem one in the homework? Uh, it's not impossible. Problem two? That's easy, right? Problem three? Similarities? No? Problem. How, how, how much RAM does it take to compute the similarities? Fifty GB. But uh, anybody did uh, so he's saying there's a problem with the similarity for the image data set. I think he, he tried something more or less naive and he got a fifty GB file. So you gotta be worried about that. I, I don't think you need fifty GB, but it might be twenty GB file. Um, that's one thing to say. You have to, so this, I'm gonna talk about a few things about that similarity in a second. One thing that's uh, in general, uh, it's that in a lot of machine learning and data problems, you don't need double format. Uh, you know, the, the eight byte floating numbers, so-called doubles, right? You, you don't need those. Those are uh, exact calculations that needed for physics or something like that, but uh, for uh, our stuff, even for fancy machine learning, single calls will do. So let's uh, talk a little bit about that similarity. It's not very mathematical. Now, we are purely in the computer science world where heuristics are as good as anything else. In a math world, we need principial derivations and arguments. In here, if it works, you know, it's good, right? So here's one thing that you can imagine. Um, let's, let's look at it like that. Maybe this is the training part. And this is test. This is test. Uh, the uh, what I mean to say is a similarity matrix is this right here. This is the similarity. K I J, right? So one thing that I want to point out is that for some algorithms, we don't need the full similarity matrix. I'm asking you to compute it in principle, but you have to take a look at the algorithm and say, do I really need the similarity of everybody with everybody? Maybe I don't. Some algorithms do not need that. So I'm not going to say what to do. I'm going to say, if you think of the data set as training and testing, maybe 80% training, 20% testing, the similarity will be the whole data set against the whole data set, right? Everybody against everybody. Now, this is the similarity on the training set alone, and this is the similarity on the test set alone. This should also be a square matrix here. And I think the KNN algorithm needs the similarity between testing and training only. So that's one thing. So it's algorithm dependent. So for KNN, only need similarity between a test point. We're going to call Z. A test point between Z and all training points.
Another thing, so that's part one. Another thing that's relevant in all data problems is that similarity, you can think of similarity between I and J, right? Or distance. Distance and similarity are very similar concepts, but they, they work in the opposite direction. Similarity is like the opposite of distance. Similarity, think about splitting it into a range that so this is low. Typically, low means minus 1 if you normalize it, but low may mean some other things. This is high. In many cases, typically means plus 1. This is the range. And this is a middle or sometimes inconclusive. Uh, say about zero. Uh, let's add another term here, random. See, in a lot of data, if you look at for a particular uh, way to measure similarity, uh, if I fix, so let's say z here, I fix z. Data point. Now I'm looking at similarity between Z and say all others. So I fix a point and I'm saying how many things are low similarity, that's typically the opposite. Right? If I have patients, I have Z as a patient, I look at the other patients that have low similarity with Z, that's probably the opposite of Z. If Z has diabetes, these guys here that have low similarity are probably the ones that do not have diabetes. I'm, I'm not saying it's always like that. I'm saying you would expect that if something is the exact opposite of some movie you like, maybe that's a movie you don't like. Right? Make sense? You guys are very quiet today. <laughs> something happened? All right. How about here? What's a high similarity? If I look for a patient that has diabetes, everybody who has extremely high similarity with that patient is likely to also have diabetes. Right? So this is the same. Sometimes even identical. If, if I have certain transactions or certain models of, say, laptops or furniture or something like that, the exact, the highest similarity will be a laptop that's identical to the laptop. Um, um, right? In some objects uh, which are manufactured by a certain standard could be identical. I, I'm having my data set, a bunch of things that are exactly the same. Okay? And this actually is most data. In reality, in nature or practice, most objects do not have a conclusive similarity or dissimilarity. So uh, if you look at the distribution over things, you're not going to see a lot of things that are extremely similar or a lot of things, uh, sorry, extremely similar or extremely dissimilar, but it will be quite a few things that are somewhere in the middle. Now for the purpose of a lot of algorithms, so here's the trick. For many algorithms, the, the similarity around zero, this range here, does not have to be recorded. That's me. Meaning, if I take a bunch of middle range here and I say that's all zero, or I, I transform it to exactly zero, it won't make a much difference for my algorithm because most algorithms work by counting on this part and this part a lot. All algorithms work on this. All algorithms like KNN would rely on the high similarity. What KNN does for every point picks up the highest similarity, right? But some algorithms, more intelligent, also take into account this. It's saying if you have some neighbors, uh, not neighbors, anti-neighbors that are very dissimilar, they might provide some information for whatever you want to do. 
very few algorithms make sense of the zero because zero you can think of it as inconclusive. I, I, I don't I can't tell whether that that's that's an indicative for my point C or not. Right? So because this is a lot of data usually, not storing it saves a lot of space. So there is a problem though. If I do this, if I do not store the middle similarity part for a point, now I have to use a sparse format. The reason is this most data points for a fixed Z will not be the same data points for everybody. I can't just say cut the matrix, some chunk, some rows in the matrix, because for every data point Z, there will be different low similarities and different high similarities. So you can think about this way. If Z is here, which ones I decide to keep? I decide to keep this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy. Those are either low similarities or high similarities, right? Now for a different data point here, Z2, it may not be the same exact five, five data points, might be different ones. So I can't simply say keep the following 20 columns in the data, because for every data point I have different low and high values. I have to come up with some sort of format allows me to store only say, maybe we keep 20% of the data here and 20% of the data here. That means we throw out how much? We throw out 60% of the data, say. It doesn't have to be the same for all data points. It doesn't have to be exactly 20%. That will save a lot of space, but will not allow you to create a dense matrix anymore. We have to come up with a way to store it. Was a question? Yeah, I just still, just now you say that if many data are similar, it doesn't make. I mean, it's it's not significant. I just feel confused, like because maybe if a lot of the data they are similar, maybe they just follow one certain pattern. Isn't isn't that helpful? I, him, I think he's saying. What if I have, for some particular Z, a lot of similar data points? Is it possible that for some Z, I have not 20 by 30% or 40% data extremely similar with that data point? I think that's what you're asking. There's two problems with that. It's, it's unlikely the data set for one point Z, one patient, to have 40% of the data set very similar with that one. If that's the case, it means that's what's called a typical case, meaning 40, 50% of the patients are very, very close to each other. And it makes sense to do something else. If the data set have such a central or typical point out of the diabetes patients, there is a typical case. Males around 60 who have certain, you know, background and certain diet and blah, blah, blah. If that, that's, that's half of my data set looks like that then maybe I should store that kind of typical set separately, right? Because I'll have, out of a million patients, half, half a million will be exactly like that, right? Or very, very similar. Secondly, to answer the question, even if that's true, most algorithms will not suffer if I have a lot of data points close to, to some patient, if I throw out some of them, right? So think about KNN. In KNN, in the image data set, how many classes are there? or labels. <coughs> Did we look at that image MNIST data set so far? How many people have looked at the MNIST data set? Okay, very few. When is the homework due? <laughs> we need to look at that MNIST data set, right? Okay, how many class are there? 10, right? Now, how many data points are there? 70,000. There is roughly uniform because there's no reason to believe fives are more common than threes in, in digits, right? So how many data points per digit? More than 10,000, right? Or 7,000, sorry, right? something like that. If out of that 7,000, I throw out half of them, I'm still having enough digits to do KNN properly, right? Like for a particular classification, like an eight or a five or a three, even if I throw half of the training set out, there are probably enough neighbors, because I only need 10 or 20 neighbors, so I probably find enough images, even after I throw out half of them, 
to get enough for a classification purpose. So the problem with most algorithms is not that you have too many points similar and then you may choose to throw some of them out. It's the exact opposite. The data that have the most difficulties, the most difficulties, are the ones that for a particular Z, take a movie for example, or a patient, I have no similar data. Those are by far the most common problems in data sets where I have items that are outliers. There's no movie like this. There's no patient like this. There's no email like this. There's no document like this. No disease like this. No president like this. Right? Every time you have these cases, it's hard to make prediction analogies run your algorithms because you have not seen this case before. There is no patience like this guy, right? All algorithms fail without exception due to lack of density. So you should not be worried when, oh, there's so much data there, I don't know how to store it, I may have to store just half of it. That's easy. The hard part is when you have a lot of items that are very rare. Uh, in the medical domain, there's this problem of diagnosis coding. There's so, a lot of diagnosis codes. I think I mentioned this last time, 70,000 diagnosis codes. Most of them are very rare. There are few of them that are extremely popular, typical cases. Uh, prediction and analysis for those is very easy. But the other 50,000 of them, each of them is very rare. Each of them is one of those Z's for which we have no data to compare with. Only appears in two or three patients. And then while the data set may look like 400,000 patients, the truth is every particular label is extremely rare. That, I think, happens to your other data set, 20 news groups. In 20 news groups, how many people have looked at that? OK. Procrastinators. The homework is due very soon, right? Let's remember that. Um, the easiness part of the 20 news groups is that it's much smaller than, than the uh, MNIS data set. So you only have 18,000, uh, I think, data points, documents. Once you pass them, the similarity matrix will be nothing, right? Because it's only 18,000 by 1,000 by 2. That's easy. The problem in the data set is that the labels, the so-called categories, are many. They're not like 10, like in the digits. They're like 100 or so. And some of them are very rare categories. You have some category for it, only there is like three documents that have that category, that tag. And if all these documents, for example, happen to be test documents, you're gonna, you, you have no way to predict that, that category, right? Because when you go to the training set, that category does not even exist. So there, there is no, shame or no criticism, if, if you have a category just in the test set, you say, I cannot predict this category, that's fine. But what if I have two test documents with this category and only one training document with that category? It's going to be quite difficult to make the analogy. So in the 20 news groups, the difficulty is to deal with all those very rare categories. Your performance by running KNN on 20 news groups will be very low. You're going to start at 45% accuracy on a test set, and if you do some magic, some tricks to it, you might reach to 60%. The ones of you who really want to put more effort into data algorithms could implement regression, or maybe if you have seen regression, run regression from a package. A regression, which is a global algorithm, very different than KNN, which we're not going to discuss in this class, regression, because we teach regression in the other classes, machine learning could give you much better for performance for K, for, for 20 news groups. That has to do with the density versus locality versus the nature of the algorithm. In the MNIST data set, KNN is a very local algorithm. It only does, we're gonna recap that, this is the point Z. It only picks few neighbors, right? This is the neighborhood. And what happens with KNN, it does a local prediction. It doesn't matter the structure of the data set, the general pattern, frequencies, nothing. All it does is that the prediction for this point relates to what happens in its local neighborhood. Regression is a very different algorithm. It's a global predictor that tries to find a pattern, a linear pattern, across the entire data point. In regression, 
even if I have no points close to Z at all, nothing, nobody around, as long as I can manage my regression line based on some points far away, I may still make do a good prediction on Z, even though there is no neighbors around Z. In the 20 news groups, running a regression algorithm can give you 80% accuracy or 85% accuracy, which is impossible to obtain can. However, in the MNIST data set, the images, the density is very high. Every, every digit, every image will have many, many images very close to it. That's why KNN would work really well. I think even a naive implementation of KNN, the worst possible, will give you like 95, 96% accuracy. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about KNN before I move on to the slides we skipped last time. Um, as I said, there's two ideas for KNN. So again, the motivated people uh, can run regression or naive based algorithms. If you do, I'm happy to talk to you about those, but we will not discuss them in class. So if you come out of these hours, I run regression on my data, here's what happened. We'll, we'll find a way to, to, to help you out. Uh, Professor, like, what we are determining whether uh, the data is inclusive, uh, do we need to pick a threshold? Like how close it in is here, to zero. Yeah. threshold makes sense if you know what the values means. The similarity values, if you pick a threshold like zero, minus 0 0.7 here, right? Yeah. You have to know what is a 0 0.7 similarity. If you don't normalize them or if you don't do anything to the similarities, say you apply Jacquard coefficient, how do you know to pick a 0 0.7 threshold? But if you pick by percentage, for every point I'm keeping so much of it on, I think that's more safe in general. Picking, saving 20% or 50% of the closeness points seems to be more, more robust than uh, picking the random threshold. But you could try. There's some algorithms that will figure out this from data, especially for, for uh, if you have some labels or some validation sets, then you can set the threshold by the data. Yes? Yeah. Uh, I just get confused with the concept of like, because in the homework it says something like training data, testing data, and the validation data. I just get confused. Well, we don't have validation data yet. Oh. Typically in machine learning, when you, when you design an experiment, you of course have training data, we all understand what that is. Testing data, you can think of it as production data. That's the one you get evaluated, that's the one you need to produce results on. But it's useful during the development of the algorithm to have some sort of internal evaluation that if you want to know how you're doing, and some algorithms require that. Some algorithms require you to know how you're doing before you proceed. Some others do not require that, like a decision tree, but you may want to know so far how am I doing. You cannot use the test set or the production set for that because test set is 100% reserved for when you're done. Your, your algorithm is done, you need to now test it, right? But internally, you may need a validation set. Uh, so it's used for two things, evaluation and objective. Another thing that's used is what's called hyperparameters settings. So some, some hyperparameters like regularization parameters. I know I'm speaking words that you may not know what they mean, regularization. Some hypertuning of the algorithms might require a separate set to the training set. A lot of fancy algorithms say neural networks even regression, uh, the regularized versions, would require these hyperparameters that you cannot do from the training set alone. So the typical setup for, for machine learning is training, validation, and testing. For this homework, we don't need a validation set. Okay, thank you. Okay, so what did we say about KNN? We said there's two options for how to pick the neighborhood. One option is pick so the neighborhood, I'm going to say here informally, is the closest k points. That's, I think that's the high school version. Like if I ask somebody what's k and n, we'll say pick the closest k, typically k equal 10. By the way, you should play with this k. In your homework, we encourage you to variate k from 5 to 10 to 20 to see whatever works. Right? But should be a constant. You should not pick 10, close, 10 neighbors for one data point and 20 neighbors for a different data point. Play with the compound. The other option 
is to say the neighborhood is all the points that have similarity between x and z at least k. So in here, k is not a number. k is a threshold. It says everybody who is that similar, or the distance, if you do distance, it's smaller than something. It's close enough, fits in the neighborhood. And we said before, there's each one of them has a, has a pitfall. In here, when you pick the closest k, you guarantee that the neighborhood size is exactly k. Not really guaranteed, but most of the time would be k. The problem is, some of those might be very far away. If I'm in a low density area, some of those points could be actually extremely far away. The problem here is what? If I pick a threshold and I say, in my neighborhood I get everyone that is that similar or closer or the distance is not more than something. What is the problem? In some cases, in a low density area, I get nothing inside this neighborhood, and then I can make a prediction. So I'm not gonna go into details here. It, depending what you use for your homework, you're gonna have to deal with those problems. So what I wanna talk about before moving on is an optional so-called extra credit, although we don't have really set up a regular point. So that's not for the homework, but I think some of you may want to do this. So how do I do a general or soft KNN? In practice, in many problems, this is much better than the hard KNN. Hard means this exact threshold. Pick exactly K. Pick exactly the ones that have similarity less than K. So here's what I'm going to say. The neighborhood, it's all training points. It's not, neither limited by similarity, nor limited by the top K. But they are weighted by this similarity between Z and X. So everybody's in the neighborhood. All the training set. But everybody has a weight or importance or influence. You can think of this similarity of C with X as the impact influence or uh, weight of X on C prediction. So now my, my neighborhood is the whole data set, the whole training points. But not everyone counts the same, right? Remember, there is a second step once I, I build a neighborhood. Once I build a neighborhood, what's my next step? How do I make a prediction for Z? I have to look at the labels of these guys and do some sort of either average or ma majority, right? If it's a category, it's a majority. Like for digits, I'm going to see, OK, what are my, my neighbors? There's a, maybe a two, two, three. Those are digits, three, three, and a, a, another three. I say, well, I have four threes and two twos. So I'm going to predict a three, right? But if I'm working on quantities, it's not the case for this homework. If, if I'm predicting salaries, or, or, or age, or something that's a quantity, it makes more sense to do a median or an average, right? But those are not weighted, right? So far, what we mean is once you have a neighborhood, everybody counts the same in that neighborhood, whether it's a majority or an average. Maybe I can do an average. Yeah, if it's a quantity. It's all a straight average. How many people would mean here? How many people follow what I'm saying? Hands up so I can see them, please. Good, because you're very quiet. Usually, people are not that quiet. No? But uh, if you're that quiet, I want to make sure at least we all follow what's going on. Uh, professor, can you can you define the neighborhood of uh, Z? Like, is it a Euclidean vector space that you're talking about? So the neighborhood is the same concept as before. It's a subset of the training set. Uh, but uh, in a representation, vector representation format, would that be a Euclidean or a 
So it's up to you how to implement it. You mean what data structure to use to store that neighborhood? That's up to you. So how do you represent the in the neighborhood? So let me talk about that a little bit from, let's go back. Neighborhood is a subset of training set. It's a bunch of points from training set. How do I get it? The criteria? No, is I mean, like, how do you represent the training set, like, in the, uh, in the vector implementation? Because if, if, I, if I use MATLAB, this would be a matrix for me. But you could use, in a, every language, different data structures. Heaps, hashes, lists. That's completely up to you. And most people would use a matrix format of some kind, either a sparse format or a dense format of a matrix. If, if, I don't know if that's what you're asking. Uh, like I was asking because for this particular problem, that like you already have a dimensional space for the training data, and now you're again using a different uh, parameter matrix, which is a similarity in that, adding the weight to that. So I'm not going to duplicate the data. It's not like. If you're thinking, okay, my neighborhood here is the entire training set, I'm not going to rewrite that. I'm just going to use my matrix that I have written the first time. All I need here is to compute those weights. The weights will be different for every point Z. Because this is a similarity from Z to all the training points. But I don't need to restore that matrix to make a copy of it. So how do you define distance in that? The distance is you have to be picked in advance, right? So either I use cosine or dot products or Euclidean distance, Manhattan distance. I'll have to, remember problem three in the homework? Ask you to compute the matrix of all uh, pairwise distances, right, or similarities. We cannot change the distance on the fly. If I choose cosine distance to begin with, I'm gonna have to stick with that. If I decide to change it to Euclidean distance, I have to go back all the way to problem three Recompute the distances and then do the rest of it. Now, in this class, programming is up to you. So, how do you actually store the weights, the similarities, the matrices? How do you find the right indexes to use? That's all, you know. I mean, I mean I'm going to forbid some things like Excel. Okay? <laughs> That's out of question. But, but other than that, how you do it in Python or Java? We're not primarily concerned with efficiency here. If you take 50 GB and you could run it in 15 and it takes three hours instead of one hour, it still counts as a vast majority of credit if you get it done right. Efficiency is a secondary concern for us. In practice, efficiency is very important, but in here, it's important to do it correctly. So it's up to you. If you use Java, you have a different data structures than in Python. So now, conceptually, these are my weights. Even the weights, they are lookup table from that problem tree, right? I already have the similarity matrix. If I compute a full matrix of similarities, I don't have to restore those weights. For every data point, I already have the similarities right here. I only have to know what row am I to read. And if I do this trick, some of them are already zero. Like in a sparse format, I don't have to go to the entire row. I only have to go to the non-zero values. So how do I do, assuming I have this, everybody's in my neighborhood, and assuming I have those as weights, I interpret the similarities normalized as weight factors. Uh, how do I do majority prediction? <coughs> So in majority prediction, in the normal version, what do I do? How do you implement majority? You count each one of the occurrences. You say, if those are images, potentially I may have all kinds of images there. Zeros, one, two, threes, up to nines, right? So what do you do? You count all of them. You see how many zeros I have, how many ones I have, how many twos, how many threes. And majority means? Pick the maximum. Same thing we're going to count in here. We're going to count each label. Right? In the normal version is just a simple count. How count how many times that label is in the neighborhood. In here, what's going to be? So again, in here, let's, let's do that. Majority of count for a label is the sum for every 
label. So every i in n, n of z, that's the data point, let's say x. Every x in n, n of z, if x label is the label I'm looking for, is the sum for each label that I, for each time I see that label that I'm looking for, I'm counting here. So I say it's the label, that's the label, is the label I'm looking for. Every time I see this L in my neighborhood, I add one to it. Right? You hear what happens? Every time this is the label, it's going to be the same thing. Every time I see in my neighborhood that label, I'm going to do what? I'm going to sum the weight. Similarity between Z and X. So I'm not adding one every time I see the label. I'm adding the similarity. Maybe I have to normalize something. Divide the whole thing by something. I'm not sure. When you do weighted averages, you typically divide by the sum of the weights. Right? And you should see why that is. Why if I do this, I can just leave it like that. I'm asking you. I'm not saying you have to do it. So now, what's going to happen here? How, how is this going to work? So if you point here, you work out, right? Right. So if I have a very close point, x, say the similarity here of this x and z is 1, this is going to count as a lot, because it's very close. Versus if I have another point here, y, the similarity between y and z. z. Z is my center. This is uh, very small, say 0. <laughs> this will not count at all, right? A 0 will not count for me in any way. Now, what happens if I have a very far off point t, such that the similarity between this point t and my z is actually minus 1? What would normally happen if I apply the formula, just mechanically speaking, algebraically? <laughs> so do I want that to happen? No, no. Right. If, if, if I'm looking at the images, the, the digits you have, and I say, I have a point Z, and I see an X with the label here, say that's a three, right? That three would count as one, but what happens if the label here, D dot label, is a three? I'm subtracting minus one, right, from there. Do, do I want to do that? If it is three, why would yeah. it be positive? Yeah, why is I, I'm just saying hypothetically, <laughs> right. She's asking a question. The, do you expect really a three? You're assuming the label of Z is three. I, I didn't say what the label. She, I don't know what the label of Z is, right? I don't know what the label of Z is. Maybe it's a three, maybe not. Am I asking here the following question? I think everybody agrees with me that if a point is very close to Z, I'm adding a high value for that count, for that whatever label is. Say it's a three. If a point is middle way, like it's not close, not far, similarity is zero, that doesn't count. In effect, that label doesn't count. Whatever the label of this guy is, it's a three or four or five or six, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't add nothing to my function. I changed my mind. I don't think we need to normalize nothing. But you should think about it. But my, my question here is, what happens here? I have some points very far away. That's going to happen. There are always going to be points far away. Is that going to happen? It is going to happen, right? What do I do if I see a label like 3? If I apply the formula, I get a minus 1. So I'm starting subtracting right now. Like, uh, is, that, is that the right thing to do? What, should I exclude those points? Should I put them in? So we don't know if I actually try to actually subtract. subtract. Th that's my question. I, I was the first asking, right? <laughs> should we use those far away points? Or should just 
threshold it like we did with this before, right? We can threshold and say below zero, everything that's far or farther than zero, similarity, ignore. That's the same as treating it as zero for this purpose, right? If I say everything that's below zero counts as zero, then in, in terms of addition, I don't have to do nothing, right? They just add all of them as zeros. Mm -hmm. My question is, would it be useful to start subtracting or do something else for points that are farther than zero? Or it would not be useful? Well, I have a question. How does this formula where, I mean, you're, if you're counting whether, uh, so if it fell in the class two, then you're counting all of those that are class two, and if it fell in class three, you're counting all of class three, then you're majority. How does that work with that? Because if you're summing all the similarities, that may or may not give you the answer that is so uh, he has a question, a procedural question. I'm summing similarities here. Note that the sum is still for label. It's a different sum for each label, right? That's the sum for tools. I'm not, I'm not combining them together. I'm saying for every label, I go through the entire set of points. I look at the similarity. I add it. But that, that doesn't count twos and threes together. I still sum up the twos together to the twos, three to the threes, four to the fours. And how do I pick then a majority? The maximum. It's the same like before, I pick the maximum count. Except it's not a count now, it's a sum of weights. My question is, would it be useful to do something about the points far away? Yes, yes. So, if our accuracy is improving, giving a negative. Right, using a validation set. Remember, you can't do that on a test set. You can't test your neural test it and say, if it works, that's good. And of course, at the very end, it's going to work very well because you just pick the method that works the best on the test set. That's not how you can do stuff. <coughs> if you do something like this, you need a validation set to try things out to evaluate. And only when you declare, I'm done, you can actually run the test set. During the training, you cannot touch the test set in any way. So he's saying, try it out, see what happens, right? That's a very good principle in this class. Try it out, see what happens. But conceptually, should it help or not? Yes. It may not help in this program. You mean particularly for digits or for, for, digits. for K and N in general? For, for this uh, means. So when, first of all, for K, when it would make a difference? When, when, when would we have a problem? Imagine four digits, now I'm coming up with stuff. This is not how the data set looks like. But imagine that this is indeed a tree. All the trees are close together. Trees, trees. Uh, and all the other four, fives, and whatever are far away, either at zero or farther. Since I want the majority, <coughs> would it matter what I'm doing with this? The majority will be the trees anyway, right? which are close to the Z. You see what I mean? The biggest count in here would be the count for label three, which is the correct label. And whether from the other counts I'm subtracting something from the far away points or not, it will not change whichever was the majority. But when would this be an issue? Don't your nearby points and we don't have enough data nearby? The problem is when every, every label is spread out in all directions. All the trees, the fours, the fives. If it looks like that, the trees are all together. There won't be a problem. And it is like that because that, that's what makes this KNN for MNIST very, very easy. If you have a tree, all the trees will be much closer than the other labels. So whether you subtract something from the faraway points or not, the trees will be much, much bigger count than the rest of the labels. So you'll have no problem determining that the label you need is a tree. What happens if this whole thing is a nebula of random things? The trees are here, 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 and here. The fours are also here, and here, and here, and here. And the eights are also here, and here, and here, and here. Now, if I do include, do some penal, this is called a penalty, this is called a reward, right? If I include some penalty for the faraway points, I'm effectively counting how many things are close versus how many things are far away. Every far away will put a penalty. Every close will add a reward. 
it only makes a difference when two classes, like maybe three and fives or five and eights, they, they look a little bit similar, five and eights, right? When they are competing, when I have two counts that are competing, two or three counts that are about the same, then it will make a difference whether eights have more far away points and I start subtracting them, then I'm rewarding the other count, which is the fives. In general, this helps. The primary uh, factor here, whether it helps or not, is not the data set. In MNIST, will not matter because the labels are too close, the ones that are the ones you need, the, the correct ones. In 20 news groups, it may matter because it's, it's a zoo in there. Nothing is close. The primary factor, whether this helps or not, is in what similarity distance did you pick to start with. This might be affected by how, how, how did you compute the similarity between Z and that point over here. So I don't think you'll see any difference in MNIST if you do this because that's already very high, but you might see some difference between 20 news groups. For some labels, maybe for some labels they are too rare, and because they're rare, you won't see any difference. But for some other labels, once points are far away, by the way, for 20 news groups, the typical similarity people use is cosine. It's a text data set, so most people by default would use cosine as a similarity. That's the first thing that I would try. I think should help for some categories to exclude the ones that are far away, to subtract them. Oh, this is not mandatory for homework one, okay? This I, I added as an optional, say, extra credit thing. If you bored and nothing to do before the deadline, you can say, okay, let me change my canon to do something more useful with it. Eventually, this becomes, if you take two more classes, what's called kernels density. And there's a bunch of theorems in machine learning that characterize the data by kernel density and your ability to learn from it. Because see, like I said, if there's a lot of density around, data is more learnable. If it's very sparse, data is not learned. That's what I have to say about KNN. And uh, for the other part of the lecture, I'm gonna connect my laptop here. Yes. So, what did Will there never be such a scenario that if the trees are very close together, the similarities are high, and when I sum them up, there will be a high number. But say there's another class, say four, where there is a lot of data points whose similarities are lesser than three, but just the sheer amount of data points, the sum may go largely. Right. Like I said, there's something that you need to look into here if you implement this. Look for something, I'm going to put a link on the website. Weighted majority. How, he's right. He, he's, his concern is about uh, the trade-off between similarity as a quantity, big similarities versus small similarities on one side. And the other side of the trade-off is the number of points included. His concern specifically is can I have a lot of small similarities that are near, uh, not near, because there's they, small similarities, but, <coughs> but there are many, right? So I have a lot of small similarities, but uh, many, versus few similarities that are very big, but few. So I have three neighbors here that are labeled three and have very high similarity with Z, and I have 100 neighbors that are far away, they're all four, they have a much smaller similarity, but there are many of them. That won't happen in MNIST data, why? Because the labels are very balanced, right? But it could easily happen in other data sets. So how do you trade off to say, how do I count few very high similarities against many smaller similarities? That's when normalization may come into play, especially if we use this other stuff. When we, assuming we normalize, well, how would we deal with this? If we divide by something here, 
this would be the sum of that's only valid if we if we if we use the subtraction part. Uh, you have to take the absolute values here. So that if you have a lot of values, a lot, a lot of points, you you essentially assuming zeros gets out here, this is acting like a count. This is how many positives I have minus the negatives versus how many points I counted total in effect. This is here, this effective size of the neighborhood. So the sum of the absolute values would be how many points actually have an influence in my prediction. But the simpler version, I think, for these two data sets will be to, to not worry about this, to just do the sums and see what, what your primary concern should be is can I obtain a better accuracy by doing the sums instead of the typical hard can. The advantage being we're using all the points now with the weight. I see that can is a non-relation, so it considers like a spherical space around it. Are there any algorithms which are more directional, like which prioritize a specific feature over the other? Sure. In machine learning, a lot of discriminative algorithms will find what's called a separation surface like a regression or decision tree, and those would be very directional. If the separation surface found is here, everybody in here will have problems, will have, will have to be separated that way, but not the other way. He is saying KNN is looking at neighbors around, but say if I have two classes only, if my separation between two classes is here, that's the positive side, that's the negative side, why would I care about the neighbors on the left side? Because I, I don't need associations to the left side. I'm only caring about what side of the threshold. Are you black or white, sick or healthy? A lot of discriminative algorithms in machine learning, once they figure out where the, the separation is, regression is the best example. Regression imposes a separation that's linear, right? It's only concern for every point how do I determine on what side of the line is? So points, the farther they are on the left side, they are easier to predict, and I, I don't need much support. That's how it's called, support for them. The closer they are to the line, the more support I would need to evaluate how far away I am from the line, right? If you're familiar with support vector machines, in support vector machines, that's exactly the principle of design. Once I have a separation surface, how much support do I need to evaluate the point? Of course, farther from the line, that's very directional because once I have the line, it's clear the directions is that way and that way. Uh, the farther I am, the more confident I am, the faster I can make a prediction. I'm not sure that was the question. Uh, it was somewhat like, but my question was like, are there any questions? Are, are there any algorithms built upon KNN, but uh, they make KNN decisions? Uh, so instead of looking in all the three, uh, yeah. Equally on the all the three directions, we can just go and look uh, in one of the directions. Oh, uh, I'm not sure. Maybe specific domain problems, especially multi-label problems, for example. I may want to build neighborhoods for with multiple criteria. I know there is a version of a tree KNN, but I'm not sure that tree provides a direction in the sense you asked for. That's something we need to look more into it. Yeah, just want to ask uh, how the, the here the same the similarity score like one zero minus uh, one how they are calculated or defined defined is it simply by distance I get because if the distance is close is very small is very close so that's yes. why it is we sign one then yes but you don't want to have a discrete similarity here you you don't want to threshold this you want to leave it I mean we you can we can you can mop the middle of it to zero if you want. For Like I said here, you can transform the, the ones that are close to zero into zeros. But the ones that are close to one and minus one, the extremes, you don't want to transform into one and minus one. If it's 0 0.75, you want to leave it at 0 0.75 because you want those weights to reflect exactly the similarity metric that you've been using, like cosine. So you want the 0 0.6 to only count two thirds of a 0 0.9. You don't want to say everybody that's more than 0 0.7 becomes a 1. Because you effectively back to counts if you count it like that. 
you want to leave the similarities to whatever came out of cosine. So the similarity here is defined or calculated by, by the distance. Distance of similarity is the same thing. Oh. I mean, it's problem three. Pick a metric and run that similarity over the entire data set. If you can do this with distances, just like you do it with similarities, right? I mean, one minus the distance or one over the distance, then you got a similarity. Okay. We don't seem to manage to get to this association rule slides ever. <laughs> yes. So, like you mentioned, that when you have when the data is cubed with trees and a lot of holes around. Like, can we just look at the data and like, remove, if the data is not balanced, can we just look at the, 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 uh, the levels which, are, which over, over one and remove them? And the, uh, the, la the labels or data points that are very frequent, they don't present a problem. Uh, the reason we sample them sometimes, it's for efficiency. We don't need 20,000 images, trees, to, to make our prediction, so we can sample a few of them, maybe a, a quarter of them, and use those. The, the, the problems we have on sparse, on low density, labels or patients, features that are very rare. And uh, we, 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 we're not gonna be able to teach right now anything principial, like uh, what to do, theoretically with those points. But in practice, people come up with all kinds of heuristics. I mean, I mean, hospitals, for example, when they make a prediction of on rare diagnosis codes, they do it manually. They know that code is rare or the patient's likely to be rare. They don't even run the algorithm. They send it to a person that's a medical expert and say, what is the answer here? They don't even bother with running a prediction algorithm on rare stuff. Same thing, by the way, happened to stocks market. The initial version machine learning data analysis on stock market was pretty automatic. And it worked quite well when they tested it. So they leave it running and they made a lot of money. Automatic machine learning algorithms who buy and sell stock. The problem is, as soon as something unusual happened, everybody lost a lot of money, instantly. <laughs> because machine learning algorithms did what they predicted to do. And they literally, on 9-11, they had to go into machines' rooms and shut the, they pulled the cords out of the power plugs so that the machine learning algorithms do not start selling and buying stuff. 9-11 was, of course, a very big event, very new event, right? So anything that had been learned for machine learning, any data algorithm, was not applicable for that moment. So. This is the kind of case, like in patients, where, where if something unusually happens, now there is a version two of stock trading, there is a trigger of, uh, I think it's called anomaly detection. As soon as that happens, the system shuts down and everything becomes manual. So the traders come in and they do the trading. So I think there's heuristics in practice in industry to prevent bad predictions on unusual or rare codes. But there is a whole theory of how, how you're supposed to deal with this from an algorithm perspective. That's much more complicated than what we can do here. There was another question. Yes? What if the uh, labels are heavily unbalanced? That is, if you have two classes and one of the classes it has very really less number of examples and the other one has a really high number. So I think that's the same as rarity. You're talking about a particular label. Like in 20 news groups, every category, it's either on or off, right? So for every label, you can think of it as binary, on or off. Now, a document may have multiple categories, but each one of them is binary. What I mean by rare is that the on part is only on three documents out of 18,000. That's the same as unbalanced. I mean, I could have it the other way. If there is a label that's in all 17,997 and it's missing on three, it's equally rare. Unbalanced or rare means the same thing. If the skewness is really like one versus thousands of documents, either off, on versus on, off, it's hard to predict. Most algorithms use a prior. You guys should take a machine learning class to figure out how that works. They use a prior. And the prior, if the label is very unbalanced, it's very dominant. If, if you have a data set for each one in a thousand, it's an on, and the rest of 999 items, it's an off, the prior would be 999 to 1 to put that off. So you would need a lot of evidence to overcome the prior, say, in a naive base algorithm. Right? Only with a very strong evidence, naive base would be convinced to say, OK, although my prior is 999 to 1, I'm going to predict that one case. 
Make sense what I'm saying? So skewness, balance, and rarity are the same things. Now, are there ways to deal with this problem? Yes, there are. Uh, the typical way to deal with, and that came from information retrieval, where this is a very common problem. It's not one into a thousand, it's one into a billion, right? So suppose I'm looking for relevant documents for Dota 2 game that I'm looking to play, right? There's probably three web pages that I'm looking for out of 100 billion pages. The rarity, skewness, or unbalance in that case is massive. So what people in information retrieval came up with is an objective that is not a regression accuracy based or least square based or like in the decision tree information game based or like in support vector machines geometric based. Instead, the objective is designed by ranking. So the, the, the objective that's being optimized by ranking functions are to pull those two or three out of a billion at the top of the rank list much harder problem. Those are typically non-convex problems, hard to optimize. So I'm still running a machine learning algorithm, but the objective is not anything to do with accuracy, because accuracy in, a, in a such an unbiased problem, one versus a billion, the easiest way to increase your accuracy is to say zero all the time, right? That would be correct. 10 to the 9 minus 1 divided by 10 to the 9. So in that sense, I could not overcome that sort of prior. But if I do ranking and I measure a ranking function as opposed to accuracy, for that you need to take a information retrieval for this. Uh, then if I use a ranking objective, it's much harder to do the mathematics derivation optimization of ranking objectives. But if I do, the balance, it won't, it won't be an issue. Even if it's one in a billion, I can still optimize for that. Uh, for people who know machine learning, things like uh, I think it's called lambda marked algorithms for ranking. They optimize ranking functions. Also used in when tournament, when they assign who plays with who. If I have a chess tournament with 20,000 players, I don't want in an early round Kasparov, which is the world champion, to play with a random dude, right? So in the middle, it's fine, because I don't have an unbalanced problem. But I have very, very strong players, which are only 10 of them. And for those players, in order to match them properly, I have to do a ranking-based algorithm. Uh, by the way, the same happens on Microsoft. They have these game, uh, game centers and all those problems when they match you with an opponent on your skill. Matching is not a problem if you're an average player, if there are many people like you. But if you are the world champion, matching is a hard problem because I need to find another world champion. right? So ranking-based objectives will work better than them say quantity or accuracy based objectives. Yes. When de when just uh, just a follow up to this question, when dealing with a uh, label that's that's imbalanced, why not to use a very simple method like uh, we just uh, like uh, for instance a lot of label for A, a very few label for B, we just get part of the label A use sub sub somebody asked that exact question before. The the the, the when you have a lot of neighbors you won't have a problem making good prediction. The only reason to sample there is to efficiency purposes. You know, start, start to store all of them. The problem is always in low density areas when you have no neighbors, and there's no good solution for that. Weighting will give you a better accuracy than hard threshold in the KNN, but still, it's a hard problem. In those low density areas, global classifiers like regression or support vector machines will work better. OK. Uh, let's uh, let's do the rest of the questions at office hours, so we can actually do a little bit of what you.
very simple question. Like uh, on the piece, there's a question about the due date because uh, it is 22, but uh, it's Tuesday. He says Tuesday. So what? Which day exactly is the due date? It's Tuesday oh. or 22. Tuesday is uh, 23. Yeah. Would you like to do 23? Yeah. Okay. Let's say it on 23 then. Uh, the more important aspect of that is that the due date is when you have to finish the code. You still have a week after that to demo it, but okay. not to change it. So you don't have to demo it by the 23. You can come, ask questions. You might get the grade. If the day is happy what you've done, you can get the grade today. But after 23, you still have about a week to show what you have and get the grade. So the date counts for what's the time when you finish your code or results. Once you have it, you forget about this. Um, This, uh, this color is too much. You know what would be useful after the class? Somebody with a different laptop, plug it in for a second. I want to know if there's a problem with the way my laptop outputs colors, because there's a uh, calibration color schema, or there's a problem with the projector, and then that's a much more complicated issue. Okay, so after the class, somebody can connect your laptop here, just to see if you still see blue and green or not. Uh, okay, so also when we do this, one of you could turn off the lenses for a second and turn them back on to get a better white uh, balance. So this is easy stuff um, and not so useful anymore because data sets don't look like that anymore. Right? The data sets everybody is concerned with today are not transaction or databases data set. We are extremely, extremely good at databases today. Everything that looks like student name, uh, age, classes, courses, grades, whatever, whatever, database sort of record, transaction, buying, selling, uh, it's a solved problem. Right? Even Amazon, who deals with billions of transactions every day, have no problem at all with computing it. These are not the kind of problems you're going to hit if you go work for a big IT company. But we'll talk about them for half an hour, I guess. So these data sets are much easier than any free sort of data set. Images, text, uh, patients, something that's free and unprocessed coming from the nature, plants, animals, so on and so forth. Uh, these are very, very structured things where items are very clearly determined, you know, lettuce versus diapers versus wine. Transactions are very clearly determined. And the internal structure of the one transaction is either a sequence or a set. In, typically, I think this, in this case, there'll be sets. There'll be no order in here. But even if I have an order, these are mathematically very, very easy to handle, right? It's a very clear set or sequence. The problem is if I give you a text, the meaning of the text is not simply represented as a set of words, right? right? If I give you a text, a piece of text, versus if I give you the same exact text as a set of words, it won't be that easy for you to figure out what, what, what does the guy say. Take a politician speech. As a set of words, there's the same set. Everybody talks about the same words with the same frequencies, but they're actually saying very different things. So if you convert an image or, or text into a set of words, you've just lost the principal source of uh, raw data. So that's why the problem with real data sets today is that they are not that simple in structure. But many years ago they were. So uh, what do we have? Transactions, those are items, right? And uh, what's an association rule? 
An association rule is uh, something between items that says if you have item X, then you also have item Y. You can think of it as co-occurrence. When I have X, how often do I see Y in there? Right. Out of everybody who buys computers, how many people buy Macs? Sort of things. X will be both a computer and Y will be that computer is a Mac. That's a simple example, but um, so let's see how this stuff works in here. If I have those are transactions, um, I would have how many times I see soy, milk, and lettuce. Again, they are sets, so don't look for orders. Uh, if I reorder this, I could have it in different order. It's the same transaction. That would be a different problem if the order matters. If lettuce implies soy, soy milk, but soy milk does not imply lettuce. That would be a different problem. But for sets, how often I see lettuce and soy milk? One, two, three, right? Three. Okay. That's, that's a simple count, right? Uh, notice that these are sets of items. So I, I hope everybody understands what an item is. It's, it's all these transactions are broken into items. And then uh, sets of items or frequent sets could be any subsets of those things. Maybe we don't need more than half an hour for this. Um, so how often uh, I see diapers and wine? The count is three, but as a proportion is three out of five. This, I think, it's called support. Support, there you go. So support is the count divided by the total number of transactions. It's purely definition, right? This is count, this is support. Uh, it's more like, you know, nobody remembers those things. You have to look them up when you, you hear them. Okay, so we've got that. Um, a little thing to note here um, that may be against your intuition, so that you have to, to think about for a second. When I say x implies y, or association rule, that is uh, out of the times I buy computers, how many times I buy Macs, or something like that. Y is not always a subset of x. Like the example I have with computers and Macs, of course Macs are computers, so they're a subset of computers. But in here, in general, uh, there will be association rules between different kinds of items. How many times I buy milk when I buy lettuce? That's not always the case that I buy milk only when I buy lettuce. So it makes sense to talk about the union. The union of, this is a set of items. This is I buy lettuce and soy milk, and this is also I buy wine, for example, the two sets. And the association rule has to do with when I buy lettuce and soy milk, how often I also buy wine. So it makes sense to talk about the union of those. That is, how often I buy all three of them. What I want to point out that's a little counterintuitive is that the bigger you make this set, the more items you're looking for in a transaction, the rarer it's going to happen. Right? So every time you see a union, you might be tempted to say, mechanically, union means more. It does mean more items, which means they happen less frequently, right? If I look at how many times I buy lettuce and soy milk, there'll be 100 times. How many times I buy lettuce and soy milk and wine, that would be a subset of these 100 times. Yeah. And that this number, the either the, remember this is the percentage, the support, and this is the count, they mean the same thing, just divide by n. This will go down. Every time I increase my set of items for whatever purpose, I add things to my transaction, the, the, the frequent, so I started with lettuce. Maybe that happens 300 times. Now lettuce and wine will happen 100 times. And lettuce and wine and soy milk will happen only 25 times. Every time I make the set bigger, the count will go down. Um, so what do I want here? Um, I can define other things. 
So for example, this is how many times I buy, given that I bought soy lettuce and, uh, and so, soy milk and lettuce, how many times I also bought wine. If you remember probabilities and how conditionals work, this is a very good analogy with that. But you don't have to know probabilities to deal with this. But if you do, it'll be easy. This is a, these are the number of transactions that I bought all three. Remember the union means all three. And this is the superset of transactions that it's only lettuce and soy milk. In probabilities, they work the same with the joint and conditional, right? If I say, how many times data mining students going to get an A? Very small percentage, by the way. So that would be, I have to count how many people register for data mining and get, a, get an A, divided by how many people register for data mining, sort of thing, which is, of course, a superset. So this is going to be a smaller count because the transactions that contain this is a subset of the transaction that contains that X. So this is certainly going to be smaller than one. How many people follow me? This is extremely easy stuff. The only difficulty is to figure out what all this means. What is x, what is y, what is sigma, what is s, what is the count. Once you know what they mean, it's very low level uh, intellect. But it is not. It is not intuitive because when we think x union y, we think it's more, but actually now Right. It's I just said that in probabilities, we have a better notation for this. So it doesn't run out of the intuition. But in here, be worried that when, when they say union, they mean more items, which yeah. means less frequent. OK? Uh, how is s different than the count there? It's the same thing, just divided by the number of n. The, the transactions. So sigma is the count, 25. S is the count divided by the n, which is a constant. So it's 25 divided by 1,000. What are we here for this for the example? So then here at the same, because this would be sigma divided by n. This would be sigma divided by n. n then goes away. Right? So the sigma and s are just divided by a constant of each other. You, you don't need both, you just need one of them. So the confidence is, in the, in the intuition of confidence, if this is a high number, what does it mean? Every time I buy lettuce and soy milk, I also buy wine, right? Because this being a subset, it is being a smaller number, a subset of this. If this is a 0 0.99, means I almost always also buy wine when I bought those two, right? That's what confidence means. OK. Um, what's the confidence of if A then B? Well, it happens one out of five times. Everybody has A here, so the 0 0.2. How about from B to A? If B, how many, how often once B is there, I also see A. One out of one, so that is a one. You could think a little bit in terms of probabilities. This is the given that B happens, what's the, the chance of also seeing A sort of thing. But I don't think the mathematic, mathematics works just as probabilities all the time. Um, I can also have this lift. Um, lift has to do with analogy with conditional independence. So just looking at the formula, this has to do with how many times they appear together versus how many times they appear separate times how many times the other one appears separate. If you know probabilities, I don't want to insist on what this leaf does for data mining, but if you know probabilities, this in probabilities is equal to the product of the two when? When the two random variables are independent. So the joint probability of, of doing two things, getting married and buying a house, is the probability of doing one times the probability of doing the other if those two things are independent. Of course, they're not. Right. But, but if they were independent, the probability of doing both would be the probability of doing one times the other. So they might say here, if it's one, it's independent. OK, so what's? 
uh, what's our problem here? Given a long stream of transactions of this kind, which is a much, again, much simpler data set than free text or images, how do you find the, the frequent items, the frequent item sets? How do you do that? Right. So that's the problem here. So remember the item sets could be subsets. You don't, you don't have to consider entire transactions. Maybe I buy a bunch of things. But a frequent item set is lettuce and soy milk. But every time I buy those, I may buy other things with them. How do I detect a frequent item set? Not one, but all of them. Frequent typically means uh, confidence or count or something is bigger than a threshold. So I want everybody that has uh, at least three or something like that. So you can do it, of course, by brute force, right? I mean, if, if you were to run some sort of hash that includes all the item sets with all the counts, right? Imagine, imagine every transaction I, I see, I store all the subsets. If that transaction contains item A, B, and C, I say increase the count for A, increase the count for B, increase the count for C, because I've seen A, B, and C. But also increase the count for A, B, A, C, and B, C, and also increase the count for A, B, C. At the very end, this hash for every single subset will have the count, right? But the number of keys in the hash, it's exponential, because the number of possible subsets in theory, it's exponential. Now, in a lot of transactions, it's not exponential. Even though if the possible items to buy are 20, theoretically, there are 2 to the 20 possible subsets, right? We all know that. The number of subsets of a set to 20 things is 2 to the 20. In many cases in practice, not all 2 to the 20 will be observed, right? There, there will be plenty of items on Amazon that people just don't buy together. So in many data sets, if the number of possible subsets is not that big, you may just do that. Run a hash, store all the subsets, and then and at the very end you have the counts. You only need to parse the whole data set once, and at the very end you have all the subsets and counts. The problem is when you see a lot of sets, so your, your keys of the hash will have to store a lot of different sets. So how do they do it? two algorithms that have been discussed here. First of all, there is an introduction of how to expand the sets This, this that I just said, the subsets, right? If you start with the single items, A, B, C, D, how do you construct subsets of two? You pair those two, right? You pair those and you get subsets of two. And then how do you construct subsets of three? You take the subsets of two, add one to them, and you get the subsets of three. And then you get all of them there's only one subset. If you're familiar with Pascal triangle, combinatorics, that will give you the counts for these lines, right? N choose zero is one, N choose N is one, N choose one is N, N choose two is N times N minus one by two. So if you look at how many sets out of N items, subsets have exactly K elements, that is n choose k. Sounds familiar? n choose k? Yeah, that has to be familiar, by the way. n choose k. How many subsets of k items I have in a set of n? This would be exactly that number. For four, this is four items. It's four choose zero, four choose one, four choose two, four choose three. Sorry, it's the other way. Four choose one, two, three, and zero. But those are symmetric. n choose k is the same as n choose n minus k. Okay? So this is what that's saying. This is for n equal 5. 5 choose 1 is 5, the single ones. 5 choose 2 is 10. 5 choose 3 is 10. 5 choose 4 is 5. It's the same as 5 choose 1 because it's all the missing. A will be corresponding to B, C, D, E. Right? It's a missing part of the set. And then 5 choose 5 is only 1 because all of them. Same as 5 choose 0. How many total subsets we have? Two to the n minus one, because it is normal total number of subsets is two to the n, but is missing one, which is the empty set is not counted. Why the total number of subsets of a set is two to the n? 
For every item, it's two possibilities, on or off, to construct a subset, right? On, off, on, off, on, off, for all n of them. It's two possibilities times two times two times two, that's two to the n. That's called the product rule, which is the same as saying if I have two pants, three shirts, and four hats, there's so many, that two times three times four ways to dress up. Because every possibility goes to every possibility. You can also do it combinatorics. N choose 0 plus N choose 1 plus N choose, N choose 2 plus N choose 3 up to N choose N is 2 to the N. You can get that immediately for something called binomial theorem. Okay. That's all in college. OK, so what do we do? How do we mine these things? How do we find the frequent item sense? Um, I'm going to skip a bunch of slides that explain this stuff. So the first one we need to do is this a priori algorithm. So here's, uh, in principle, how it works. We go by the subset size. So easy to compute item frequencies. You just do a pass over the data set and you count every item that you see, right? Some of them will be more popular, like bread. Others will be less popular, like eggs, perhaps. Then the principle of this a priori algorithm is to, it has two steps in a cycle. The first step is from round k minus 1 to go to round k. To say, once I have frequent sets of size k minus 1, how do I get frequent, possible frequent sets of size k? So that is, of course, take whatever you have and add one term to it, right? If those are frequent sets, I take the frequent one diapers and I add something to it, I create a candidate. But then immediately follows a pruning step, which says, once I created candidates, maybe some of them are not that frequent. Because when you create candidates like beer, milk, um, you don't know. Beer and milk may both be very, very frequent, but the combination is not, right? I bet people don't drink. Can be at the same time, you buy milk can be at the same time, I guess. That's the implication here, right? Do you do that? No. So what happens? I created a size two set from size one set, but I prune it, I say that one's not frequent, take it out. And then of course I have frequent size two sets. I create candidates of frequent size three sets, but again I prune them by frequency. Now that's a general but of course, you can, you can do this more efficient. I mean, there's many naive ways to think about it. But the principle of the a priori algorithm is create frequent item sets of size k, or k minus 1. Given those, create candidates for size k. And I'll prune the candidates that are not frequent enough. That will require some way of counting. You may have to go over the transaction set again to see which ones of my candidates are infrequent. So that will be very inefficient because if at every round, creating the possible candidates is easy. Because I already know which one's frequent. I have maybe single item frequency or something. Creating a bunch of candidates that I think might be frequent that have length k plus one, one more, that's easy. The hard part is now go over all of them and figure out how frequent they are. Even though I have few candidates, I still have to go over the entire data set of transactions, right, to count them. That's the hard point. Usually, the, the set of transaction is gigantic. The number of items may not be that big. The number of frequent sets may not be that big. But the list of transactions is usually huge. So every time you have to do a step that says go through all transactions, that's usually the Achilles heel of all these algorithms. Because you don't want to go to all the transactions again and again and again. Going through a list of candidates, no problem. Going through all the items, no problem. But going through all transactions, a problem. So there's some discussion of how to do this efficiently. This is the main algorithm, right? I have uh, the transactions at k minus 1. I create the candidates for set k. So I, I do k candidate, k, size k now. For each candidate, I have to count them. That means I have to go to each transaction. 
So there is a loop here. That's the size of the set I'm looking for. This loop is k equal 1, k equal 2, k equal 3, the size of the set. This loop goes through all transactions. And this loop, for each candidate that you produced, increase the counts if you see. That's easy. The problem is here, that I have to go to all transactions for every frequent item set. Now, fortunately, maybe the, the maximum size of the frequent item set will be not more than five or six, right? Because in most cases, even though you have a lot of transactions, a lot of items, the frequent sets that happen are maybe at most five. Uh, so that would be at most five loops. After five, if I have no frequent set, I'll stop. Because if I couldn't find any frequent set of, say, five, there's no point going to six, right? Every frequent set of five things will be a subset of many sets of four things, right? But if I have a frequent set of five things, I must have a lot of frequent sets of four things. Every, one, every four items in that five will be frequent for four, right? If, if a sequence of five things appears a thousand times, every subset of four in them appears at least a thousand times, correct? Uh, so another way to do this, instead of, instead of taking fk minus one and adding to it one item to create candidates for fk, Maybe it would be easier to look at fk minus 1 and fk minus 1 and create candidates by saying, if I see two frequent sets that have some common parts on them, like they all have lettuce and soy milk and da da da, but differ in one item. One has you know toys, the other one has milk. Maybe if I put toys and milk together to create a size k, right? If this is size k minus 1, there's k minus 1 items in there. This is size k minus 1. But I'm only looking for ones that have a lot of common in there. So they have all the groceries. The difference is in one item, this one has toy, that one has milk. My guess is that if I put toy and milk together, create a set of what size? k now, because all the common ones plus those two that are separate. Maybe every time I do groceries and buy toy and milk, if I buy toys, I also buy milk, and every time I buy milk, I buy toys. That makes a good candidate. So this is more efficient than this, because in a lot of the beer versus, versus uh, milk case will happen if I have common items, common items, but they just don't go together. That's unlikely to happen if there's many common items in the set, with many common items between them. The problem with beer with milk is I have no additional items to count on to make some sort of context. What did I do that day? But if I have a lot of other items around, I bought groceries and I you know, call certain people, so on and so forth, they create similar what's called contexts. And then whatever I did in those contexts may have happened in the same time, which makes sense to put together a bigger item set. So there's a version for how to do that here. Uh, for twos and ones, I go to threes, and now uh, by pruning, I think I keep only this one. But the next step would be, it's not written here. Um, okay, so this assumes a representation that have um, this is not how you store it in a computer, of course. You wouldn't store bread and um, what do we have here? Let's see. Beer, diapers, and bread. Beer, diapers, and milk. Bread, diapers, and milk. So how do I get these from 2 and 1? It's not the slide we're looking for. This is, this is just crossing F2 with F1 to get F3, right? Yes. So this is the basic one that says, here's I have F2, here's I have F1, I pair them up, and then I do the pruning to obtain the frequency. But what's the one that's F2 times F2? So how do I do this? 
I said if bread and diapers are common, right, and bread and milk is common, I get the bread in common and then I union the other two, I get a bunch of candidates here. Uh, a more interesting slide would be to say I have sets of three and sets of three, how do I get a set of four out of it? The idea is to keep the k minus two common parts together. You want that to create a context and only combine the two items that are different and put it together. You still need, once you have candidates, I, still, I think you still need to go over the transactions to verify those candidate counts. There is no way to know. No, there is maybe a little way to know. How can I tell something about this count? So this is smaller than bread and diapers. It's also smaller than bread and milk. Right. So I know an upper bound to it, but I don't think an upper bound is what I'm looking for, right? My, my idea of pruning is to prune everything that is below certain something. So even this, this is like 100, and this is like 100, do I have any guarantee that this is at least 50? Is there a way to not prune something to say, if that was high, bread and diapers, and bread and milk was also high. Can I say that this must be high? No. Or somewhat high? I think that would be good to get a shortcut here to say some of those don't need to be pruned. If what's high enough here and high enough there, I know it's at least that high. Maybe not 100, but 50 at least, so I don't have to prune it. Other than that, I'll have to go through the transaction set again. Anyway, let me try to speed this up. What we really want to do is not do that, okay? We want to do something else. We want to create a data structure that facilitates this. And that data structure is something you play in problem two, I think. It's called the F, uh, frequent pattern tree grows, FPTG. So how does that work? What we want is to create this on the right side. This is very easy to do. If you know what a tree means, which is a requirement for this class, by the way. This is extremely easy. What do I do? I take the transactions. Maybe I sort them somehow, maybe not. I take that Z, Z goes right here, right? And then I put R right under. Why is R under Z and not on this side? Because it comes in the same transaction, right? And at that point, my count will be one and one. This is the final version. Actually, let's move to how we build it. So here's how we build it. Initially, I have Z and R, right? Uh, and uh, again, those are sets, but I have to read them in some order. So I think I, I before this, there is a step of sorting them so that the most frequent ones are likely to come first. But I don't think that's a requirement. So if I see another transaction, What's going to happen here? What do I do with this x? I put it under z because it comes through z, right? And why z is now 2? Because I see it twice. But x is just 1, 1, 1, 1, right? So you can imagine that I take every single transaction and I plug it into that tree by updating counts, right? So here's another z. This z, what does this z has? What effect it has? It increases the count of z alone. Now I've seen Z, X, and not an S. Why this X here is outside? It's not under Z, right? So I have to put outside. How many people follow me here? So this is very easy to follow how this tree is. So the very end, I think, is something like that. Um, yeah. What? Like the header table. This, the transaction? Yeah, the one on the bottom. Oh, this header table? Yeah. The, this you're going to need to do parsing of the tree. So in a tree, we have the root and we have the links, child, and so on and so forth. But in here, we also need some way to go through all the eyes. So you need another set. This is for my navigation purposes in the tree. I need X to be, I need a way to point 
to this x and from here to point to the next x to the next x. Suppose I want to read all the x's in this tree. I'll have to go to the root and parse all the subtrees because I don't know where the x's are. But if I keep track of a list of all the x's, I could just read the x's count if I want to, right? So this is just for navigational purposes. An auxiliary structure built to a link list of all the uh, uh, items. Yes? Uh, we don't have order in the transaction, so we could say in the first place is that because the tap uh, happens to appear uh, the most count. Z, yeah, there's a pre-processing step that Z is the most frequent. Okay. And that's why it's sorting both the, it's, it's prunes, it takes some of them out, but then it sorts them in a certain order. The, so I skipped the slides that says, what do I do initially with those transactions to arrange them in some order, and maybe even skip some of them. So we need to solve every transaction at first? What? So we need to uh, solve the every transaction at first? I think this is sorting all of them. Uh, with Z at the top, which is the most frequent item. Is it necessary? What? Is it necessary to do so? I can't hear you. Uh, is it necessary to solve them? Uh, I don't think it's necessary. I think you get the tree anyway. But for this tree to work for whatever purpose you build it, it's better to have the high counts at the top. So if you more about them, so this is contact because the Right, it will be a messy tree. But I think it will still be a valid tree. We can build it. Let me get to the point of this tree, huh? <laughs> so we can do it again for our different transactions, A, B, C, D, same exact tree, right? Everybody can see that this is the end of it. Now, what do I want? I want to get the patterns out of it. Once I build the tree, how do I get the frequent stuff? You pick some item, say in this, they pick Y. And you look at, how do I get the subtrees that end in Y? Right. So that, that, that would be the subtrees that end in Y. I don't know if I have something under them, but I just look at the subtrees that end in Y. And uh, again, the mechanics of this is extremely easy. You just have to worry about the count and see. Um, this, it's, imagine I chop it off from the tree. So I have the main tree I already built. That's never gonna change. But every time I pick a Y, I'm cutting some subtrees from that main tree, and I'm writing it on the side. So this is not the main tree. It's only the part that ends in Y. And I didn't change the main tree, but I'm gonna change this. The main change that I'm gonna do, I'm gonna say, what is the count of Y here? Two and one, right, total? Three, change things to maximum three. Like this Z is five because there were some things in here that were not ending in Y. Z had some transaction that didn't have Y in them. So that's why Z is higher than the Y's. So I'm gonna make this Z three here. Because for my purpose, the trees that end in Y, I wanna keep only the counts. These are the counts from the main tree. But I wanna keep the counts only relevant to this sub tree. So it turns out I can do that very simple by just lowering everything to how many Y's I have. I don't have to reparse the three. Right? If the maximum is three, then this Z might be three or less. Question? You may have to, if you, you don't have to implement this for the homework, but if you were to implement it, you would have to think, okay, this Z, what's the total number of Y's that I can reach from this Z? It's actually three, not five, so make it a three. So that would give me the frequent items I need. So once I make that Z a three, uh, here, right. I'm gonna be able to write down the frequent items. Uh, because now I, I can threshold it, I can say, is it really, if my threshold is two, I want the frequent items sets that have at least two counts. Once I finish the counts changing, I could tell that uh, Z, X, S to Y has the count at least two, so that is a frequent set. So the first part is fixing those counts. The second part is, once I'm at Y, I can move to the T's <coughs> now. We don't have time to discuss that, but the next step in those sub is to say, that's ending in Y, what's gonna happen if I end it now? So if I remove the Y's, 
how do I get up in the cloud? I don't want to talk about it next time, but we have to close now. You should look at those slides to understand how that works. Um, if you don't, we'll talk about that office hours. This is a far easier algorithm that you'll see in the algorithms classes, the graphs and tricks. So if you took an algorithm class or if you plan to take one, this should be a piece of cake. And the uh, Weka, what's called it? Weka Explorer, it does those things for you. Sorry about taking longer, but you guys don't let me finish them. So I tried three times. Oh yeah, can you check if, if what do you have? Can you check if you are out green or maybe it's my left one. We don't need any particular. <laughs> 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 